till Svenska Danföreningens andra webbinarium eh, i en serie av fem under det som vi kallar Rocktober. Jag heter Annika Linkvist och jag är kommunikatör på Svenska Danföreningen. Rocktober är ett am amerikanskt eh, begrepp eller fenomen och eh, det heter i USA så säger man att oktober är Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Det vill säga medvetandegörande månad för eller en månad för att medvetandegöra Down syndrom. Det tycker vi är en väldigt bra idé och hänger på. Svenska Danföreningen är en rikstäckande förening med lokala avdelningar i 19 av Sveriges län. Vi har cirka 3800 medlemmar. Vi tror på alla människors potential och lika värde. Och vi arbetar för att öka kunskapen om Down syndrom och driver påverkansarbete för full delaktighet och självbestämmande för personer med Down syndrom. Vi strävar efter ett samhälle där personer med Down syndrom har, är jämnbördiga medborgare och kan vara delaktiga utifrån sina egna individuella förutsättningar. Vi ger också personer med Down syndrom och deras familjer en plattform där de kan göra sina röster hörda och skapa möjligheter för aktiviteter, möten och gemenskap. Idag så ska professor Sue Buckley från Down Syndrome and Education i England prata om barns tal och språkutveckling i upp till sex års ålder. Det är ett område där hon är mycket väl meriterad och har fått flera utmärkelser. Vi kommer få hennes presentation för publicering på vår hemsida tillsammans med webbinariet som vi spelar in. Och efter presentationen så har vi tid för frågor. Så du får gärna ställa dina frågor i chatten under tiden så tar vi dem efteråt. Och är det så att du, du får gärna ställa dem på svenska så översätter vi. Det är inga problem alls. Så, so, Sue. So. Exactly. It's a great honor to have you uh, you here as a speaker today and we are all very eager to hear about the uh, speech and language uh, developments for our young ones. So please welcome and uh, we are all ears. Okay. You can hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Okay. I I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you're okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. So you can see that in screen view now. Yeah. It, well, thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to your your program of seminars, and um, I will try hard to stick to time. Anyone who knows me knows I have too much to say and too much information on the slides. So apologies for that. Um, and I'll try to go through the key points um, as concisely as I can to leave time so that we have uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, and I am going to share the slides and I can probably answer any questions we don't get through uh, after the presentation. So the focus is on how to support speech and language development um, in the early years. And this is what I'm going to go through. I'm quickly going to summarize what we know about how all children learn to talk. I'm then going to look at what we know about how this may be affected when you have Down syndrome and obviously pull together what the implications are for effective interventions and then spend a little bit more time on talking about how we develop communication, how we develop speech, sound, processing and production, how we build vocabulary, how we then go on to help children to build sentences and master grammar and talk about how we can use teaching reading to help with that. Okay. And now I'm sure you know already that speech and language development is usually more delayed than it should be relative to our children's 
nonverbal abilities, speech and language development is the most delayed area of their development. It falls behind and doesn't keep up with the understanding they show in nonverbal domains. So it's not all explained by just cognitive delay, not having enough uh, understanding um, to develop meanings of words and, and to develop language. Okay. And that was an important landmark when some years back, um, Robin Chapman, a very renowned researcher in the States, emphasized that children with Down syndrome have specific speech and language delay. It's not just linked to cognitive delay, it's a specific profile where it lags behind nonverbal abilities. Having said that, I'm sure you will all know already, there is huge variability, huge variability. Um, and I'll try and come back to that later if I can. But youngsters with Down syndrome will say their first words anywhere between one and three years of age or even later. Uh, by the time they're five to six, some children will have 50 words and signs. Some children will have over 400 and be talking in short sentences. Very big variability. We know some of that's to do with hearing, but other things probably as well. Um, and once they get into school and they get older, they're often still only using two and three key words, the nouns, verbs, adjectives in the sentences to communicate. And that's linked with speech production issues. And very often they'll still use a single word if, it, if it's enough to get their communication across or to respond to someone. But often using key words and more difficulty gathering, uh, developing the grammar. So even as teenagers, many folks with Down syndrome are still doing that, those key word utterances and their speech is not clear. And this really hampers, of course, their social lives, their learning, their interaction. Now, so it's really important that, that we look to see what we can do about understanding this and what we can do early. And we do know quite a bit about the reasons for their delays and difficulties. Importantly, we do have some evidence we can make a difference, um, not only with extra teaching and input. Most of our children learn to talk without us thinking about it. Most of them just pick up language by being immersed in the everyday world. There are differences. The better the language environment at home, the more vocabulary, the more grammar, the more language children have when they start school. Input matters for all children, but especially for our youngsters with Down syndrome. And we have consistent evidence that when they're fully included in preschools and schools where all the other children speak, where the language environment is, if you like, typical, their spoken language is better. We have consistent evidence their environment matters, just like all other children. Okay, now let me just recap what some of you may know already. Um, but when we start to talk about developing speech and language, we need to understand that there are four components or four domains is often the, the, the professional jargon, four domains we need to think about. Communicating, that's getting your message across. Um, a youngster might actually have quite a lot of spoken language, but still not be very good at using it to communicate effectively. So when we're thinking about communication, we are thinking about how you get your message across. Um, when you're little, you start with nonverbal signals, but it, we use nonverbal signals all the way through. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about all of this as we talk about intervention. You have to learn to take account of the listener. So as you become a more effective talker, you adjust to what you know the listener knows. Once you're into school, you develop the ability to tell people what you've been doing, that's narratives and to hold conversations. And in other words, communication skills develop right up into adult life. You're becoming a more sophisticated communicator. In order, of course, to learn to talk, the first thing you have to do is crack the code and figure out what these words mean. You have to realize these funny sounds around you are words and they have meaning. So you have to build up a vocabulary. You have to crack the code, learn the meanings of lots of words. And we continue to add to our vocabulary right into adult years, okay? And for everybody, um, developing vocabulary, developing grammar is strongly influenced by being able to read. Up to six or seven, most children pick up most of their vocabulary by listening to everybody else or watching the telly. Once they can read, 
the rate of vocabulary learning goes up because lots of new words they're exposed to in books. So vocabulary matters and it matters to go on thinking about it. Grammar matters. Children start off learning vocabulary using single words, putting two words together and then understanding the rules we use in sentences. Uh, the rules we use for plurals, past tenses and so on. And again, more sophisticated grammar continues to be learned in school years by all children and is strongly influenced by learning to read. Now, the other bit of all this, you might understand lots of words, you might understand sentences and have a lot you want to say, but you're not going to be able to say it unless you can produce speech sounds and words. And of course, we could have examples here of children who understand a lot, but perhaps have cerebral palsy, so have difficulty with production only. Um, if we think about a bright child on the autistic spectrum, they may have a lot of language, but not be very good at using it properly for communicating. So there are other children where this, this system, we can see weaknesses in one area, strengths in another. So for our children with Down syndrome, um, speech matters, the ability to produce spoken words in the same way as you hear them, in your community. You need to hear and discriminate the sounds in order to understand words. In English, examples would be hat, mat, cat. They'll come up again on a slide. We need to, be able to hear all the sounds to discriminate different words. They may only vary by a single sound, but have completely different meanings. We need to be able to produce the sounds, okay? And then, of course, once we're into production, where we put stresses, how fluently we speak, matters and you pick that up for the language you're listening to and again it takes time for all children okay now if we look at the same breakdown for youngsters with down syndrome i mentioned already strengths and weaknesses um, examples now for the children with down syndrome we consider their communication skills a strength right from when they're little, they want to communicate. Now that will be affected by effectiveness over time. Some children may retreat and not be so good at communicating, but they will tend to use whatever they can, signs and gesture to make themselves understood and get their message across. And their early nonverbal skills are good, but later we need to think about that narrative and conversational skill development. Vocabulary, they start to learn words more slowly, but they continue to add new words up to adult life. And over time, we consider vocabulary learning a strength. And that's because when we're doing research, if we use age-related measures, by the time they're eight, nine, 10, their vocabulary age will be well ahead of their grammar age. <laughs> They'll be learning more words, but the grammar's more of a challenge. Okay, so picking up the grammar rules is more of a challenge. They do do it slowly and they're, a variety of issues around why that might be the case, not all of which we understand and not all of which experts would agree about. But build, understanding and using grammar matters. So we, we still tend to have this keyword speech that uses the key information carrying words and leaves out the, in English, it leaves out things like the and a, the articles, the grammar markers and so on. But you can get a long way getting your message across with keywords, okay. And we think the speech difficulties impact on that. It's harder to string more words together when you have speech production issues. So grammar and then speech production are considered to be weaknesses. So we have another uneven profile where you know, um, communication and vocabulary learning are relative strengths, grammar and speech bigger challenges. Now, what do we know about the reasons for this? I hope I'm not going just too fast. I hope you're all keeping up. Okay. Uh, well, and I've summarized here. It, uh, my, my big take home message often when I'm running training is to remember that all aspects of our children's learning, learning from listening is difficult. Yet for all our other children, this is the main medium of learning. They learn all the time because we talk to them in classrooms at home and everywhere else. For our children, learning from listening is a challenge, often because of hearing loss early on. Eight out of 10 preschoolers have fluctuating hearing loss due to glue ear or conductive loss. And studies have shown extent of hearing loss does influence progress, as you would expect with both spoken speech development and language learning. And then 
again, um, going back some years now, uh, a verbal short-term memory weakness. Now, when we talk about verbal short-term memory, it's part of a working memory system. And it's the short-term system designed to hold on to words while you process them. You're all listening to me. Your brains are taking in strings of words. And until you've got a sentence, you can't start to process it for meaning. The order of the words in English will matter and so on. So there's a system for holding that language in short-term verbal memory long enough for the brain to make sense of what you're listening to and maybe to start moving the information into longer term store. Now, the span of that verbal short term memory grows through childhood. It develops as language develops. It's influenced by speech skills and language skills, okay? But we do know there appears to be a weakness. A quick test is a digit span test where you ask children to listen to random numbers at the rate of one a second. So two, five, one, kind of game, can they repeat it back straight away? Okay. When we do that, our youngsters tend to have really quite limited verbal short-term memory. So it, this is this learning from listening is going to be difficult. Their, ver their visual short-term memory is more effective. And I should have that on the slide. Visual short-term memory is keeping up with non-verbal abilities. Verbal short-term memory isn't. We also have children where we know learning is a bigger challenge for them and may take more time and more repetitions for them really to master something and to be really effectively stored in their long term memory. So they may need more inputs, OK, uh, more repetition of words before they really stick. But if you're not talking very well and you're not trying to say ook, ook and pointing at something or starting to attempt a word like b for ball in English, you may not get responded to. A typical child, as soon as they discover they can point, hold things up, say look or ook, you will respond. And we do have some studies showing our youngsters with Down syndrome are at quite high risk of having less input during these early years. And it, this is a difficult one because communication, it takes two to talk. It's interactive. So we need to be compensating and being consciously aware that the youngster may not be triggering us to talk to them as often as other children. I've stressed already, we know inclusive environments make a difference. And then health makes a difference, not only because of hearing issues. There are papers showing poor sleep influences language and cognitive pro progress. And we could spend the whole time talking about that. A 2020 paper has just appeared suggesting that in this preschool age, the children were under four, um, the more sleep disturbance they experience, the poorer their um, memory and they conclude it's influencing long-term storage of information and long-term memory. Okay, so what are we gonna do about this? What are the interventions we can enter into? Well, obviously making language visual, which I've implied already, all right, that visual supports are really, really important. Um, and so visual supports for memory and hearing issues using pictures, signs and print, and real objects, of course, using, uh, allowing children to see what you're talking about. Visual supports really matter. And developing that verbal short-term memory, of course, if, if we're using visual supports, short-term memory becomes less important because a picture can stay there. You can repeat a sign. Um, and if things are in print, they stay there long enough for the child to uh, take it in you've reduced the short-term memory load. The verbal short-term memory system typically uses a phonological or speech-based code. And so the hearing matters, but also discriminating speech sounds matter. And I'll, I'll come on to that. Okay. We obviously want to compensate for barriers. So it's really important to have regular hearing checks. And I'm sure that probably happens for you in your system in, in Sweden. It's important that children do wear those aids. I know that can be a challenge, that they're properly adjusted so they're not screaming in their ears or ineffective. It's also very important because the hearing fluctuates and we're often not clear whether they're hearing or not hearing. And you can have a hearing test, they're all right, then they get a cold and they're not all right, and then that clears and they're all right again. 
So we recommend that parents consider their hearing is always suspect in these early years. So we need to speak clearly. We need to use signs. We use, need to use the visual prompts. One of the benefits of signing is you wait for eye contact. The child needs to be looking at you to see a sign. A typical child can hear you if they've got their back to you and you're talking to them. But one of the things about signing is it encourages eye contact. They need to be looking. All children do lip reading, speech reading. They use face, the shape of the mouth and the face uh, as cues to what you're saying, all children. Okay, so we want them to see your face and we want to reduce that background noise. Don't have the TV and music on all the time at home. If you've got slightly reduced hearing, background noise matters considerably. We have children, of course, where there's also a high incidence of needing glasses. Their vision isn't perfect. And you can see I've got a little thing about, you know, aids being clean, properly adjusted, et cetera, and spectacles being kept clean. I get really cross if I go to preschool or school and the child comes out with glasses that they can't see through because it's an adult responsibility in this age range. Okay, And obviously, we've already mentioned sleep. Um, and uh, getting advice if you have either breathing related difficulties or behavioural sleep issues, which are common and there's more and more research appearing all the time. Many children with Down syndrome have very restless sleepers and it's not just due to breathing related. Children with no breathing related apnea still restless and still inclined to develop behavioural problems. And you can ask a bit more in the questions about that if you want. So what can we do to improve the learning environments? Well, I've said some of this already. There's a real risk of getting less input. They may initiate and start conversations less, of, less often, including the pointing, the very early cues your other children give you to get you to talk to them, to get you to name something because they point at it or hold it up, okay? So you wanna be conscious of that. If they're in special settings, the language environment is not adequate. I'm sorry, I'm absolutely black and white about that. Not only do the other children not talk, uh, and you only learn to talk if somebody could talk back, it takes two to talk. The adult conversation in a special classroom where most children are very delayed will not be the same as the adult language in a regular classroom. I'll leave you to think about that. Our children may be less included less often in conversations because they can't join in. This becomes particularly obvious as they get a little bit older and they still can't join in. So you need to think about it. We also may prompt too often and too quickly. So we do need to keep talking to our children and raise the input, but we need to give them time to join in. It takes them longer to process information and organize a response. So it's sensitive two-way interaction, waiting to give them time to sign or point or make a sound, okay? But often we prompt too much. We ask questions that only need a one word answer and we speak for children. And I could elaborate on that. Um, you know, you get a child coming to school and the teacher says, what did you do yesterday? Child says, park. Oh, so you went to the park, did you? And did you go with granddad? Child only has to say yes. We know from research, if that teacher had said, oh, that's interesting. Can you tell me more? Even deaf children will elaborate more. We know from studies with deaf children, adult behavior can be holding their language back. I'll leave you to think about that. Lots of learning opportunities then with other children their own age, right from when they're babies. I've got lovely video of nine and 10 month olds watching each other and copying each other. Children with Down syndrome, uh, 10, 11 month olds getting the attention of a three year old in the playroom by making noises and then cooing with pleasure when she looks at them. They're learning all the time from very early from other children. Okay, so the, the take home message is think how you can communicate better with your child or, it, you know, think about if you can, you may be doing all of this already. Okay, so then when we get to intervention, the reason I stress those four domains is they matter. In a typical child, we don't even think about it. They go from nonverbal communication to language. They build their grammar at the stage, their vocabulary and their understanding makes them want to put two words together and then develop sentences. Their speech clarity comes along all in sync. 
you know, so if they're at 24 months with their communication skills, they'd be 24 months with their speech, 24 months with their vocabulary, 24 months with their grammar. It's all happening in sync. So you don't even think about it until it gets out of sync that one of these areas is dropping behind, okay? So we need always to think for each child, what are their communication skills like? Where have they got to in speech, sound development, in vocabulary and in grammar? We can develop act activities to help children progress in each area. We know the order of development. So all the research we have on youngsters with Down syndrome does actually tell us that um, they build, build their skills the same order as everybody else. They learn vocabulary in the same developmental order. They build their speech sounds in the same developmental order. Okay. So we've got, a, a, we know from what they can do now, what the next step should be. Okay. We also know that progress in these areas influence each other. Okay. So a quick run through that. Um, children uh, learn to communicate non-verbally first. Okay. They smile. They uh, babble and you respond. They start making eye contact before they, well, before they babble. They make noises. They smile. They make eye contact with you. They love the face-to-face -face babble games. They start taking turns in those games. They're quiet when you're making a noise and then they join in. Turn-taking matters, of course, for talking, that we listen when someone's talking to us and then we have a turn. Turn-taking starts early in babble games. Then they learn to point and um, show you and of course by that stage they're making noises and attempting to copy words okay they need to learn about facial expressions and body postures okay. um uh, so all that matters so so although we think about these non-verbal skills as something i've just described they do as babies as a lead into talking they have to get joint attention too which means to start with those face-to-face -face babble games you're just talking to each other and the next stage is when you say, oh, look, there's the cat. And you point to the cat and the child looks at the cat. You're having a three-way interaction now. That's joint attention and they know you're talking about the cat. Okay, and they can manage that three-way interaction. The more of that joint attention you see in all children, including those with Down syndrome, faster they learn to talk. So all that early stuff matters, but we go on doing it. Yeah, we go on doing it always. We're using the eye contact, the facial expressions, the body postures and so on. And then, of course, the ability to hear and produce speech sounds I've stressed, but I've also pointed out already, it influences the first words children say and later the sentences, okay? And so it matters. It isn't just about clear speech and it's hugely important that children learn to discriminate all these sounds early. So because it influences discriminating words and developing that short-term memory system. Vocabulary matters because it paces progress into joining words together. 50 to 100 words before children put two words together. So in English, start to say daddy gone, big dog and so on. Something like 250 to 300 different spoken words before they start plurals, possessives and grammatical structures in sentences. The facts are the same for children with, and young people with Down syndrome. Spoken words is what's been assessed, okay? Spoken words. They need as many spoken words to move into sentences and grammar as other children, but they'd be a lot later getting them, and often in school at this stage. Okay. So I've stressed already that communicating early is a strength. The smiling, eye contact, looking at you, and then using eye gaze to look at something to get you to talk about it. They may not be pointing yet, but they might look at something. And this may be especially important for children who are more delayed in their progress. They have to learn to understand and interpret facial expressions and tones of voice, that body postures indicate how we feel, you know, or we may say something, but our facial expressions and body postures contradict us saying we feel okay, when clearly we don't. We pick all this nonverbal stuff up. They start to produce sounds, the turn-taking, pointing, showing, I've stressed already, okay. They're really, really important. So one really big message when you've got a baby and a toddler is to keep up communicating, but be really sensitive to responding to all your child's attempts to communicate because uh, 
like any of us, they'll give up if nobody takes any notice, okay? So it's looking, it, the level of communication matters, and that includes remembering to keep talking when you're getting them out, bathing them and so on, because that's the opportunity. When you're washing, dressing, etc., giving them dinner, they can see what you're talking about, they see what you mean, okay? You're talking about things they're experiencing, thinking about, and that's when they're likely to see the link between the word and what um, and what's happening, okay? So keep talking, giving them time to respond, but keep up the level of communication. And again, this is really, really important for the most delayed children, that you're watching and encouraging what they can do and watching carefully to see if they look at something or show any other way of trying to communicate with you. I've mentioned already the less initiating and less requesting. So less initiating, we need to be thinking about the fact they may make fewer attempts at words. They may do less of the hook and pointing. There are games to, and, and there is some evidence that the children do less requesting, okay. Uh, and so there are games you can play to encourage that. Bubbles, most children like bubble blowing. So if you blow some bubbles and then stop, wait for them to encourage you to do it again. Any signal, jigging up and down, getting excited, pointing, making sounds, but wait for them to ask you. Wind up, little wind up toys, wind it up, let it jump about. When it stops, wait for the child to indicate that they want you to wind it up. You can put something into a a little jar and they need to ask you to unscrew the jar. Think about these things, okay? It matters to prompt requesting and to give children choices. So they need to request, okay? And not, do you want milk or uh, uh, not, do you want this or this so that you only need a one word answer? Okay, is it milk or juice, milk? Well, you can start there of course, but we don't want to just keep prompting situations that only need a one word answer. The other thing about communicating is it's social learning. So lots and lots of communication, lots and lots of social experience is A, how all of us learn to develop our language, learn what we do and don't say in different social situations. It's also about picking up all the social rules that are different from one community to another. And I can't stress enough, the more social experience from word go, the better. Children learn. They can't learn how to behave in church or how to behave in the preschool or how to behave if you go in a shop, except by being there. Okay? <laughs> they need to be in the situations where we're all demonstrating how we behave. So the more social experience, the better. Okay, speech sounds then. Now, I nearly put this before communicating and then thought I really shouldn't because somebody will tell me off. Actually, children's speech sounds are really, really important and not taken enough notice of. And it's not about talking. I am still driven mad when families get in touch and say their speech and language therapist says they can't work at clear speech till the child starts to talk. They're totally ignorant of the literature and they've missed the point. OK, the brain starts to tune to the language your baby's listening to right from the first weeks of life, if not before. OK, um, babies can discriminate the sounds that anybody's tried at four to six weeks of age from any language. Right. So Japanese, English, French, Swedish, whatever. That same child goes on to tune to the language or languages they're hearing. So by 12 months of age, they're no longer so good at discriminating sounds they haven't heard and better at the ones in their own language. The brain is tuning very early because it's critical. Speech and language and interacting with people is critical to all aspects of human development. Okay. You need to tune in early. The short term memory system is gonna use that sound system. Doesn't know whether you're gonna arrive in Sweden or Russia or Japan. It's got to be tuned by the language the baby's hearing. It's got to learn to discriminate the sounds. And I've used the example already that many words may only have a single sound difference. So it's important for comprehension, not just for production. If we want to think about ways to develop it, then um, we need to start off by making sure children can hear, discriminate between, and then say all the speech sounds. And some of you will know we encourage starting this in the early months of life, teaching children to pair a sound with a picture. 
so that we can then test their discrimination. We can put the pictures down. Can you show me? Can you show me? T okay because we can test that they can hear the difference and that they're learning those sounds long before they can make them, okay? So to start with, it's can they hear all the different sounds? Can they discriminate the ones that are quite close together? Some sounds are much easier to discriminate because they're quite different and others are quite close together. Okay, so they need to hear them, be able to hear the difference between them. So they can hear the difference between hat, cat, mat, rat, sat and then they need to be able to produce them. Most children start to practice the sounds in their babble. And there is a few youngsters with Down syndrome do babble a range of sounds, but I don't think they do it effectively and they don't practice enough, okay. So they then, all children then learn to put vowels and consonants together and start to say words, um, to start, start with things like moo and boo and t and p, a, a, a vowel, and a consonant and a vowel, and then crack, more, putting more sounds together. And the mantra here is practice, practice, practice. Producing clear speech is a speech motor skill, but it is a motor skill. And for all motor skills, the brain has to establish a motor pattern. You know from all motor development, those motor patterns in, improve and become more precise with practice, okay? There is some evidence, there's not much research on the speech issues, but there is some evidence from back in the 1990s that practice matters in this age group, okay? And so we would go from the discrimination games and you can use reading cards, phonics cards uh, for this, because phonics cards, of course, are teaching the child to listen for all the sounds in their local language, all the sounds, the individual sounds that that you would be using in Swedish or using in English. So make sure they can hear and discriminate the sounds. That's where I would start with a child needing help. Are we sure they can hear and discriminate all the speech sounds in the language? Then where have they got to in producing them and putting them together? Um, and the more they hear the language, of course, this is helping the brain to tune in. So this talking, okay. And you will know, many of you probably, that we have a see and learn speech program. And the principles, which are here, sounds, then combining sounds, then practicing whole words are the same. But often, nobody bothers. The child says a word well enough for you to understand it at home at school, and nobody is helping them increase the accuracy of that production by practice. So think about that. Vocabulary learning, some of these ideas I've mentioned already. Um, we know what to teach. We know what order children learn the language. Sound discrimination matters. Signing helps. The evidence says that up to about four and five, our youngsters with Down syndrome, because of the speech production delay, can sign words they can't yet say. So signs increase the total number of words they've understood and can use. Huge variability. Many children don't get beyond using a few signs and often prompted in imitation. So I might say, do you want a drink? And the child imitates drink. But that child doesn't run in the kitchen and ask for a drink without a prompt, okay? So signing helps. Signs get them to look at you. Signs often give them a cue to the meaning of the word. It definitely increases and raises communication between everybody and the child. The signing increases your awareness of communicating with them. But by four to five years, most children are dropping it. And the research says once they can approximate a spoken word, they'll attempt a new word in its spoken form. Okay. Always, of course, speak with the signs and encourage a response to all use of voice. Encourage them to make a sound. Always. They need to know, and they usually do know, the, the end point is to be able to say words like everybody else, right, and not become over-dependent on signs or go on using them when the child no longer leads them. We would argue you should keep a record. We need to know what words the child understands. They'll understand a lot more than they can sign or say. And we've got checklists for English where you can record words understood, words signed, words spoken only in imitation, and then when those words are actually used spontaneously to ask you for something. We base them on something called the MacArthur Communicative Development Inventories, and you'll have a speech, Swedish version of that is available. Okay. We need to teach and practice words. There are a number of studies saying it isn't just enough to play. 
they won't pick them up just by play activities like other children. Play matters. Play settings are great for teaching, but prompting production, encouraging the child to imitate the word after you. When you once you know they can start to do that, prompting production is effective. And the few intervention studies we have all say that. Encourage imitation. Don't overpressure. OK, but encourage imitation once they can. OK, so that's a number of key principles, regardless of the language. And then joining words together. Um, if we we know that moving into sentences is paced by the number of different words, and it also indicates, indicates of course, the amount of understanding the child has of their world is reflected in the number of different vocabulary words they know. And they'll start to join words together when they want to tell you more, when they're linking their ideas together, okay? So there's a steady link, okay? They don't start to put two words together and say things like big dog, daddy gone, until they get to 50 to 100 words. They don't start the sentences. And this research has been confirmed in other languages other than English for children with Down syndrome. So we would suggest that when you get to encouraging sentences, of course, you use words you know they already learn, know from your vocabulary record, words they understand. Choose those for making sentences. Um, and then teach the sentence structures and grammar in the order in which typical children would build them in Swedish. And I'm assuming you're, most of you are teaching your children in Swedish. There will be an order to which they string words together and start to crack the grammar. Okay. And then the last thing I'm going to stress, and then I will stop in time for questions, <laughs> is teaching reading to teach talking. We learned many years ago from parent observations how many little ones with Down syndrome could remember printed words and you could use it to help support their spoken language. Okay. Uh, recent studies in, in Canada and other places have supported us. We're not totally mad. Um, we're teaching three-year-olds to read, okay. It's often sight wording, word le learning is a strength through school years as well, and by which we mean their reading is often better than we would anticipate if we just measured mental age or intellectual ability, or we measure their language knowledge. They read better than you would expect given their spoken language development and their underlying cognitive development, okay. And turning that around the other way, it's why it's so important we start teaching reading early. We don't have some teachers saying they're not ready yet because their cognitive development's not here and their language is not here. Okay. Right. So we would start once a child shows enough understanding and we play in our vocabulary teaching programs. We're saying you need visual stuff. You need to practice with pictures as well as real objects and play. So we would start teaching to match children to match pictures, put the dog with the dog, put the tree with the tree. Uh, once they can match them, we would test they're getting it by putting out the tree and the dog. Can you show me the dog or give me the dog? Can you show me the tree? So matching, then choosing pictures, which shows you they're beginning to get it, even though they may not be able to sign or name that picture. They can dis they can show you they understand it. It's a tree. It, that's the tree and that's the dog and that's the cat. So match and select pictures sign or name some of them. And we start the reading when we think they're ready to join two words and two ideas together. So they can match and select pictures, sign or name at least some of them, but they can show in their play that if we've got a dolly and a teddy and cups and beds and so on, and we say, give dolly a drink, they can choose the dolly and choose the cup. Put teddy to bed, they can choose the teddy rather than the dolly, put the teddy on the bed. So those play activities are really good for children illustrating their understanding, as well as you teaching two and three keyword language in those play settings. So choose words they understand to teach as sight words, use the same routine of matching, selecting, um, saying or signing, which they've learned already with picture matching. They can already play this game with pictures where they're going to do it with sight words only, just printed words. And the last the really important thing from day one is if we're teaching them to read tree, that they can put the tree on the picture of the tree. Obviously, at the start, we'd be prompting that to help them, but it's important to test their understanding from day one. We know that as readers, their reading accuracy will get ahead of what they understand if we're not careful. We have children with language delay, verbal short-term memory delay, whose reading aloud can get ahead of understanding what they read. 
So we're absolutely bent on making sure they have a small vocabulary. And when they read those words and those sentences, they can show us they understand. So a view of this is to make simple books. I've got it on there. We might start with teaching family names with pictures of the family and then go on to a book where you add a verb. Mummy eating, daddy eating, Billy sleeping, mummy sleeping. So we're building slowly and each new word, verb, each new book, of course, has the family names plus just one new word, the verb. And then we're going to develop into mummy is eating an apple and so on. So we're building them. But uh, we want every time to make sure they understand what they read, okay? We want to make sure they can read 40 or 50 words in sentences, in little books, printed or homemade, before we'd start trying to teach them to understand how letter sounds work in words. And you can ask more about that. But letter sound, developing phonics, the ability to sound out and decode words or think how to spell, develops slowly for all children. And it gets better the more reading experience they have. So last slide then. I've gone fast, but there should be room for some questions. It's really, really important that, I mean, I ever since I started any work in this area, which is more than 40 years ago now, I realized very quickly that learning to talk underpins everything. The number of words you know, the way you can string words together underpins your ability to think, reason, remember, you do it with internalized language as you get going. You think in silent speech. Developing children's language understanding is absolutely critical to developing their intelligence or cognitive stuff that we measure, their ability to think, reason, remember, and of course, for socializing with everybody else and developing their independence, okay. So for me, it is the most important thing. That doesn't mean I don't think we should develop their motor skills. All these things interact, okay? But speech and language is really, really important. It needs to be supported for the first months right through the age range. We've evidence they can continue to learn and grow and develop their language as teenagers and, and adults. I've stressed it's learned from listening, but we can't do that very well listening and talking, both are compromised, so make everything visual. Practice, practice, practice is a mantra for me. Doesn't matter whether it's about learning to hold a spoon or run or talk. Every human skill, including speed of thinking, is affected by practice, 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 okay? And very often, I think, some of our children's delay is due to lack of practice, not lack of ability, okay? We don't give them enough practice to get there. All four domains, matter I've, stretched, matter, I've stressed that, speech sounds, vocabulary, communication. We need to be working at them in parallel, okay? And they influence each other. And the last message, of course, is to keep talking. Because while we stress a bit of extra teaching every day matters, the most important thing is being immersed in a good communication environment where people talk to each other, talk to the child, listen to the child, respond, okay? Now, I hope I haven't gone too fast. Um, but we do have, I think, a few minutes left for questions. And we will circulate the slides. Obviously, our stuff is in English, but the principles apply. OK, we'll circulate these slides to you. Okay, So I'll get out of that now. OK, right. I'll stop the sharing and then we can all see each other. Right. Yes. OK. Thank you very much, Sue. That was so interesting. And I think also a wake up call for, for many uh, that we need to uh, uh, remember that it takes two to communicate and that we, mm. that yes. we keep talking, but also uh, giving, giving the child yeah. room or time to find the answer and to not, yes. not use those closed questions, which just needs a single, single word word answer so yeah that was really interesting well and you are recording aren't you yes we are so yeah. for those of you where i went much too fast in english you will be able to go through it again <laughs> and hopefully that'll help exactly yes and we will we will put it out on our website and i'll send you the slides that you yes. can share as well that's great thank you um we have some questions here and uh, let's see. 
uh, from Anna Pernstotter. She asks, is it better to use short sentences and talk more slowly to our children? Well, that's a slightly tricky one. Um, for all children, people tend to, with babies, you tend to alter the way you talk by stressing words. It's called mother ease in English. You know? There's a, people make a natural adaptation early on to stressing key words when they're talking to babies and toddlers. Okay. So yes, it may help to go a little bit more slowly and stress key words, but I would say people do that naturally, although that might change if they have lowered expectation for their child with Down syndrome. What you must not do is stop, you, you must talk in grammatically correct sentences, okay? Mm. Don't shorten to key words, even though sometimes therapists suggest that. Children pick up the grammar from hearing the sentences complete and hearing the intonation patterns that go with the grammatical markers, okay? So children pick up the grammar from hearing fluent, grammatically correct sentences. So use shorter ones. Don't use complicated, long sentences. Use short ones, but grammatically correct. Okay. And we have another question here. Uh, is there anything to keep in mind for bilingual children? children? Okay. I am American and speak English to our kids while my husband speaks Swedish. I am the most uncertain uh, when it comes to teaching the reading part. Okay. Uh, well, first, there's the most, the best research comes from um, a lady in Canada. Um, uh, Elizabeth K. Rainingbird, and she has done studies showing that when children are in a bilingual environment, and of course where she is in Canada, it'd be French English, um, the children with Down syndrome pick up both languages more slowly, but in the same sort of pattern as other children. So the, the evidence is definitely expose them to a bilingual environment if that's your family situation, okay? Mm -hmm. And don't assume they can't do it. I mean, I know older children who can read and write in two languages. Okay. So it's expose them. Bear in mind our children are all very different. So the extent to which they may pick up two languages may vary, but they'll often understand the language they don't speak when granny comes. They'll show they've picked up comprehension. Okay. Now, I suggest that people do the extra teaching in the language the child will need at school which I think is what's being asked. You know, if we're going to start teaching more vocabulary and teaching reading, that's only my suggestion. We have published one paper, colleagues, uh, which I can send you the reference to, of a child who reads and writes in Russian and English. Mm. And I think they started teaching her to read in Russian. So that was their first language at home was Russian. And then they moved to the UK. They started to teach her in Russian and then moved to English for school. So they did start the other way around. They started with the home language. Um, but my usual advice is it's probably more sensible if you're going to introduce reading for the language they're going to need in school. Okay. Uh, okay, that's a good answer. And uh, now we have another question here. Hold on a second. Um, should we speak in baby voices or not? Speak in? Baby voices. No, not after a while. As I, I think I probably sort of half answered that. Yeah, you, you, know, you naturally tend to do it with babies. And there's a view that what you naturally do is stress the key words they're ready to learn. You, you know, you emphasize key words. But no, <laughs> definitely not. And, and it's very important to remember how old children are. Now, all right, we've got developmental delay. Um, we have developmental delay, but your two-year-old is a two-year-old and should be out in play groups with two-year-olds. Mm. When they're 13 and 14, they're gonna hit puberty the same age as everybody else. They go in and out of school at the same age as everybody else. And mm. believe me, many of you will know I've got an adult daughter. When she was 22, she had a boyfriend. At 14, this child who was really quite delayed wanted to wear her jeans and sit with the boys in the bus. Yeah. And it was a wake up call to me to stop thinking about her as having a mental age of three. Yeah. She didn't talk as well as a three year old, okay? 
she was going through life based on her age and she needed to be supported to do that okay yeah. Yeah. so if you want inclusion you're going to put your six-year-old in a classroom with six-year-olds so think age appropriate when thinking about some of these things you don't talk baby talk to a four-year-old okay but i'd also say do what comes naturally you know parents are often very good at at understanding what their child is picking up and what's the right way to do things but really the age appropriate thing matters and i'm very hot on that in terms of behavior don't baby them don't make excuses they've got good social understanding they can develop age appropriate behavior if that's what you expect don't have granny and auntie coming around and spoiling them and saying oh they're only little okay behavior being able to fit in in social situations is the most important thing for their adult lives okay, okay. If you want them to get out there and join in in the world, you need to be able to take them to cafes, restaurants, age appropriate places, and they don't draw attention to themselves. I don't mean perfect when they're little, of course it matters, but it, you want the same expectations, including dealing with sleeping and behavior problems. Anyway, okay. okay. Yeah, we got, there are some questions coming in. I hope you have time to-, to Yes, I'm okay, uh, yeah, I'm okay. fine. And for, for you, uh, Sorry, Sue, I'll take this in Swedish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Om det är någon som behöver lämna på grund av tid, vi kommer dra över lite grann eh, tid här med frågorna som kommer in. Så kommer vi spela in, eller vi spelar ju in så då kan ni titta på, på nätet i efterhand. So, I'm back to you, Sue. <laughs> um, we've got a question here. I would like to know more about sleep disturbances. Uh -huh. uh, right. Not to due to breathing but behavior how can we improve this sleep okay well this is another whole lecture of course yeah what i think i should do is send you some links to references probably um but the, the, there are probably three sorts of, of sleep issues the breathing ones where the child wakes because they need to clear their airways mm -hmm. and then that often leads to restlessness and they wake up and they want you to come and give them a drink so some night waking may be related to breathing issues some night waking may be related to this restlessness that they thrash about and sit up and fall over and we videoed this years ago with night cameras okay mm. And realized it wasn't just the children with the breathing and there's more research supporting that so restlessness but behavior problems are the same as for all other children they need to learn to settle by themselves i only listened to an update sleep seminar last week from an expert researcher from our down syndrome medical interest group children need to settle to sleep on their own don't rock them cuddle them with bottles breastfeed them put them down asleep they need to learn to settle quietly by themselves. Because if you put them down asleep, then when they wake in the night, they want you back. <laughs> okay. mm, so good, good patterns of calming down in the evening, warm baths or showers, reading a story, but going to sleep by themselves should start by six months of life. Babies should learn to stay alone and play happily right from the early months, this self-settling really matters okay and then of course not giving in regular bedtimes regular routines mm. regular meal times in my view matter really when you're when you're delayed life needs to be predictable mm. yeah. so routines really help children to settle and adjust to what's expected so there's a lot about just general good management in not going back to pick them up you know uh, the reason i was saying there are link there are links to good um websites giving advice to parents but it is basically good behavior management um and obviously i could talk for a long time we have online courses which are on the list one of which is a parent course where i'll hold your hand to go through behavior difficulties if you want me to <laughs> uh, it's on the link to the online courses but there's a set of rules that are same for all children you know we need to observe the problem and document what it is and then put a strategy in place to deal with it but very often don't sleep with them you know very often parents again it's this oh they've got down syndrome mm. forget that bit <laughs> 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 that often leads us to do the wrong thing as parents and i mean i did all the wrong things don't get me wrong it's it's very easy with hindsight to be full of wisdom at this stage <laughs> 
We all make mistakes with our first children. We all make mistakes with our child with a disability. I'm not trying to criticise. The important thing is to know you can change it and to get some help. And we do, you can, you can send me messages. I know my staff in the background would be cringing because we can never keep up. But we do have, you, there's a help thing. You can send messages and they will come to me and I will we'll answer them. But I prefer you to do one of our courses where we can do it properly. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, got another question. I was wondering regarding when they are of preschool age, is singing songs with a book while singing equal for language development as reading book a book is i have a new new non-verbal four-year-old who prefers singing books yes while, okay while, while we sing to regular books okay well it's probably both okay and when you mention a non-verbal four-year-old my first question will be do you know how much he under he or she actually understands because people describe their children as non-verbal when often they've got quite a lot of comprehension they may be signing a bit so on. many four-year-olds will still not be saying many words okay um, and you're right singing is fantastic in other words the two things are both important for all children singing and repetitive rhymes is often the first time they join in and put a word in as you know in English, there's a Ring of Ring of Roses song where you all fall down. Well, down becomes a word they all know and so on. Um, so singing is lovely and we don't know enough about singing in the brain. I think there are definitely issues about how children pick up and hang the words on the tune. OK, but I would also encourage reading. There's no reason because they're nonverbal not to, tr to see if they will learn to read some sight words and you can use that as well. And when we're talking about the reading at this age, we're talking about making little books that are at the right stage for their understanding. It's also equally important to read lots of simple storybooks. Reading together does teach children lots of language and you can encourage them to point, you can show me the dog and so on. So it's both. It's not either or. Both things should help. And it, the important thing is not to underestimate a child who seems to be going more slowly because sometimes the reading will take off and it's being able to read that encourages them to say a word. The other thing I should have said that I didn't put on slides is there's quite an interest now on speech generating devices, especially for more delayed children. You know, the, the iPad screen where you press on the apple and it says apple and then it gets you know, you can put sentences together. These speech generating devices are being looked at more in the States for all children with Down syndrome. Somebody did a little study with, I think they were only about two year olds. They were real toddlers just starting to talk. And they showed if they could press the button and the, the machine said cat, they would copy it. They would copy the machine. So prompting production, which is an issue. But there's also a study of six to eight year olds with quite severe autism, not Down syndrome, but non-verbal children delayed by autism, showing that the speech generating devices prompted them to use their voices at six, seven and eight. Okay, so that's something else to think about, which we don't, I don't have much experience of doing. Um, obviously, some of our apps do that, but that was <laughs> <laughs> they weren't designed to think about that. Some of the apps we've produced, but of course it's all English. I mean, obviously you, you can touch it and it will tell you what it is. Anyway. But you will have, um, you will also have Swedish versions of a lot of the apps around, I'm sure. And I'll have a think about that, see if I can send you any links. There's a clicker program that'll build talking books. Whether, whether there's a Swedish version, I don't know. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, then we have, um, see here, um, there's a question about school here. Uh, my son is eight and in a mainstream school, second grade. The teachers do not have any special competence yes. uh, with having a child with special needs in class and no uh, adequate resources to support them. Uh, do you have any success stories from the UK where a school is using your material and learning approach yes. to share? Well, the short answer to that is yes, okay. <laughs> but obviously all our training 
um, and lots of our colleagues who've worked with this in the past run training and outreach programs for schools. Um, but that that problem would still exist in the UK. Yeah, it would still exist that there's a, a school who's got an eight year old in class who's not had a child with Down syndrome before. And so we'll have the whole range of very good inclusion to very poor inclusion. OK, it still happens here. Um, the, but I'm not sure about how your system works. I mean, here funding is provided for extra assistant help in the classroom. And those assistants are often very good and they do pick up, I mean, they do take training, they do join our support groups and there's other people running Facebook support groups for teachers in the UK and assistants, I mean, specific to Down syndrome. Um, so it is about looking, I mean, I have contacts with people in the University of Oslo who are in the special education department. Um, there's no excuse for there not to be decent outreach and decent training. Uh, oh, I'm thinking of Norway, not Sweden. Uh, there's no excuse, though. I mean, there will be links across across the countries. I'm sure there are people in universities in Sweden who could be doing a better job of outreach. Um, and uh, as I say, our children have an education plan which becomes a legally required document. So if it states on there, they should use materials and the staff should have training about learning in, with children with Down syndrome, they have to do it. So I think it's about looking at your education system and then gently leaning on the school, but leaning, I know some of you will be very rural areas, which makes it much more difficult. Mm. Although, yes, sometimes, well, anyway, yeah, uh, it, it, there's no excuse. They do need, and the other thing to stress is, right, there will be other children in every class who have delayed spoken language, maybe not quite so delayed, Delayed verbal short-term memory affects one in 10 children. Poor reading comprehension affects one in 10 children. There's really no excuse, okay? The sorts of difficulties our children have run right through the population. So other slow readers in class, other children with delayed language, the issues are the same. And that's one of the problems by us making it sound too special to children with Down syndrome. In fact, all children benefit from visual learning sports and so on. So it, it matters to really get teachers to take that on board. An inclusive practice where every child's an individual in school. Every child may need the curriculum simplified. Any child in school. You need to get in their heads. Inclusion is about good schools. Inclusive education is about meeting each child's needs appropriately. It's not about sticking in the odd child with a disability and trying to make them fit in a system. In this country, we still have nearly a quarter of our children leaving school not adequately literate for the workplace and they end up in prison. It's mm. the same in most Western countries. Mm. Okay, we could spot those children when they're five yeah. and we could do something about it, but we don't effectively. And I really labour that when I run training in schools. Okay. This isn't about a child with Down syndrome. This is about every child, and particularly the ones who fall behind, often the boys. And by the time they move into our secondary system, uh, they're well behind with their literacy and so on. It may be social deprivation, it isn't always, but even if it is, if we don't do something about it in the school system, where are we going to? Mm. Okay, we need to be doing it in the preschool system. Anyway, you get the message, don't you? Yes, that I do. Sometimes we make, it, we make it too <laughs> special. And that's an excuse to not have this child with Down syndrome. I've actually Whereas, also asked that question. You know, it's just that yeah. common common disabilities or special abilities. It's just gathered a bit more compactly on my son. You have yes. a school with a thousand pupils. Yes. It's not that special, but they're yes. like flabbergasted. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to be quiet now. Thank no, you. No, so no, no. It's all right. I got I got carried away as well. <laughs> uh, but I think that is an important message for your organisation. That inclusion mm. is good for everybody, and particularly the 20% that we fail in our systems at the moment. It's the mm. same message. Yeah. They've mostly got similar profile of learning issues. Yeah, we also always say that uh, what is good. good for good for our yes. our group of, of yes. people is also beneficial for everybody yes. else. Yeah. So um, we have a few questions left too, but I think due to time racing away uh, 
would it be possible for us to send them to you and you can yes certainly and we can put it on our website yes certainly yeah. so yeah. and again if people were a bit you know i know i I always talk too fast. If people want to go back to the presentation and then think of any questions or they've had time to do that, I'm quite happy for you to send them. That's and as funny. you know, to, to make the presentation public yeah. um, and I'll post you the slides, which I tend to tinker with right till the last minute. So I'll, I'll send them to you as soon as we sign off. Okay, that's lovely. That's lovely. Thank you ever so much for your engagement and for telling us all this and, and talking to us today it's been a real privilege privilege to have well, you thank here. you thank you for having me yeah thank you and uh, talk to you again sometime okay okay thank you bye Shane. everyone bye uh, och då vill jag tacka alla som har varit med idag och alla inspirerade frågor uh, och det ja, tråkigt vi kan inte få svar på alla men det, vi kan inte hålla på hur länge som helst heller vi ser till att få svaren och så publicerar vi dem på hemsidan Helt enkelt. Jag vill också väldigt kort innan vi slutar berätta att nästa webbinarium är följande torsdag den 15. Det är också ett, ett lunchseminarium och då är det professor Magnus Tiderman från högskolan i Halmstad som kommer att prata om den forskningsrapport som han har arbetat fram tillsammans med två andra forskare som handlar om övergången från ungdom till vuxen för personer med, med funktionsnedsättning. Det ska bli väldigt intressant. Och har ni inte anmält er så finns länken för anmälan på vår sida, hemsida under Rocktober. Så ni är hjärtligt välkomna då igen. Tack så mycket för idag. Hej då!